great. And as uh, I'm Amy Symington. Uh, so I'm a nutrition professor at George Brown College. So I teach um, uh, just a general nutrition elective for anybody who wants to take it. I also teach a nutrition and labeling course uh, to chefs. And then I'm also a research associate at FIRST as well. Um, a little background about me. I also was uh, a George Brown or Emma George Brown grad. I did their culinary management nutrition program a few years back, and it's um, basically half nutritional skills, half nu- half half sorry, half culinary skills, half nutritional theory. Um, previous to that, uh, I was at Queen's University where I did something completely. I did film and media and drama as well, um, all the while working in kitchens. Always interested in nutrition. Always interested in art, actually. Um, but never thinking that I could make something of it. And then that's actually when I went to George Brown College, and I loved it so much um, uh, that I'm back now, and that's where I teach. Um, yeah, and then a little also in, in, in addition to FIRST, in addition to the Food Innovation Research Studio, I'm also a Kitchen and Nutrition Program Coordinator for Gilda's Club, which is a, a not-for-profit organization. They deal with cancer survivors and their family members, and so I'm, I'm the head chef there, and I create... Uh, health promoting recipes for the the members and their family members before they go to their group meetings and that stuff and then I run nutrition workshops and just basically talk about why nutrition and food is such an important ingredient in cancer care okay so that's aside from the food innovation research studio and we're going to talk a little bit today about a couple of the projects that we really loved working on and that we also think is kind of applicable to the topic that uh, that we're talking about today. Okay, um, I think we have a little bit of a video first about what is first. <laughs> so uh, we'll watch that and then we'll get into more detail about uh, two specific projects that are near and dear to, to Candace and my heart. <laughs> sound. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so a little technical difficulties, but um <laughs> Essentially, just while you're getting that um, organized, (laughs) Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about a project called um, Healthy Learning, Healthy Living um, that uh, discusses in detail about a project we we started with the Toronto District School Board. So at some point in your life, you probably uh, went to high school or public school and you encountered cafeteria food. And when I grew up, it was a lot of um, hamburgers and french fries, that sort of stuff. And uh, about three years ago, there was a bill that was passed called PPM 150 that essentially said you couldn't couldn't serve these things in cafeterias anymore. And so we were approached by um, the Toronto District to NQP to to create recipes that were healthy, tasty, but also appealing to high school-age students. At the same time, also taking into consideration food wastage, um, using local produce, that sort of stuff. Okay, so I'll talk in more detail. Are we ready to roll with this? Oh, perfect. So here's about first. So you'll learn a little bit more about what we do there. Imagine bringing your product to life here at the Centre of Hospitality and Culinary Arts. Imagine walking into a store and seeing a product you helped develop sitting right on the shelf. My name is Jeff John Higgins, and I want to work with you here at FIRST. We're going to do a test of the water activity in your actual finished product. What you're looking for is that it's going to be stable and safe on the shelf. Food Innovation and Research Studio is a unique open kitchen where our students and our industry partners get together and work on very cool and innovative applied research projects. I can look back at it saying that what a right choice we made to come to George Brown. Because that passion that I had for way back in fam- my family ties and our, our weekends eating sketches together as a family and trying to make this here and now work at George Brown, I see that same passion in this school and these people are working with us on this project. 
It's really exciting to think that things that we've made are going to be eaten by people outside in the real world. You see a finished product on the shelf and you don't necessarily have a concept of where it started and how long ago it started what the hurdles are. I think um, problem solving was fantastic and the students were an integral part of that. They're creative, um, they're, they're, there's an endless source of ideas and it's really interesting to be able to have the enthusiasm and the creativity of the students matched with the experience of people who've worked in the industry. So not just as chefs and as food scientists, but actually in the packaged food industry to know what the parameters are. Here in the Food Innovation Research Studio, we're developing recipes that are both nutritionally responsible and taste great. We involve students in the process. So students um, that want this experiential learning and they want to get outside of the classroom, they come to us and say, how do we get involved? And, um, and we tell them some of the projects that are involved in and, and which ones um, they want to be part of. I ask my instructor, please get me involved in every project you can think of. I'll volunteer my time. I'll do anything just to get involved. I just love it so much. One of the big things that we offer our partners when they collaborate with us, we offer them structure. They've got a great idea up here. And that great idea has to translate into pots and pans. and also has to translate into dollars and cents. Is it a viable product? We have a wonderful, diverse, a group of students here at the Central Hospital in Coney Arts, and they add so much richness to everything they do. That's what makes it special. That's why when people partner with us, we can collaborate and look at things through a different lens. We can really create something new and something different. Okay, great. So before I go into the HL squared stuff, I think Candace is going to say a few words about your favorite um, project. I kind of stole, stole your thunder there. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so take it away. So I know the video shows that there's a lot of activity going on and lots of people, but first really is a small audience. There, is, there are two scientists and myself, but our strength and our creativity comes from the faculty and students that we have been working with and have been able to work with and bring their expertise to our office uh, on whatever project it is. Any time we need a nutritionist, any circle to prison. <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about my favorite project. One of the projects I was most proud of is called the Ball of Parkinson's. So we have a, uh, a neurologist specializing in movement disorders come to us and she found a need for um, a website and for recipes for her um, her Parkinson's patients that she prescribed the levodopa medication to. So levodopa is a little bit, it's a medication, it's a little bit funny, where you have to take, um, you have to eat when you take the medication. But if there is a certain amount of protein in your medication, your body absorbs the protein instead of the medication. So your, the medication really is, you know, it, it provides no relief for the patient. So, the neurologist would recommend it to, to her patients and say, you know, you have to eat low protein, but a lot of people don't understand what low protein is. So they were going home and eating a slice of bread, which has more of the protein than they actually are allowed. And they were getting their relief, and then she would come back, and they, they had a problem troubleshooting exactly what the, the issue was. So we designed breakfast, lunch, and snack recipes that were that met the low um, protein requirement, but was also delicious. Um, that they would take their medication with. But at the end of the day, for their dinner menu, for their dinner option, we provided high protein recipes that would bring more of a balanced diet. Um, in addition to being nutritionally responsible, the recipes were the recipes were. Uh, simple, but to prepare, and it was something that the whole family could enjoy. So we didn't want a patient to go home and feel like they were eating in the hospital. We wanted it so that if they were to take the time to prepare a meal, everybody in the family could eat it. Um, so that was, a, that was a, where our, our students' creativity is came in. Um, so we also had a different part of the college, the, the Center for Construction Engineering, develop a recipe 
develop a um, website to feature the recipes, to feature information on the um, medication, uh, how to deal with certain symptoms, uh, and this was all under the guidance of the neurologist, as well as um, their, the faculty on, on their end. It is a live website, if you uh, have some time, I really think it's going online, it's called Live Well with Parkinson's. <coughs> to see all of the, the, the great recipes, which some of the photos that we featured um, on the slide right now. So the patients and their caregivers along the, throughout the process were actually invited to our studio. We have a, a beautiful facility where we, we do cooking demonstrations and have everybody sitting around and it fosters a lot of um, uh, discussion and, and learning. Uh, the patients came in, they got to interact with our students, uh, learn a great deal about uh, low protein and nutrition just from this, this great, great department. Uh, and we invited the patients to take so some of the ingredients, uh, we provided them with the ingredients, we provided them with feedback cards and asked them to go home and make the recipes and let us know what their, what their thoughts were on it. So we knew that it was successful. Uh, Great. Okay. So that yeah. So that's one of one of many projects. There's so many at any given time. I don't know. You have like upwards to like ten, ten projects. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just crazy. So that's one. As as Candice is mentioning, the pictures that you're seeing featured here are some of the stuff that we're doing. So some of them are from the Parkinson's project. Um, some of them are from the healthy living, healthy learning um, project that I was speaking of before. So what we did was. Um, Again, we were faced with this task to provide recipes that were nutritionally sound. They met the nutritional requirements of this bill that was passed about three years ago, um, but also, again, appealing to high school age students. So things like butter chicken, um, Caesar salads, uh, fish tacos. Uh, and this is where part of the student's creativity comes in, was what's, what's trendy in terms of, uh, of food. Right, right, right at this moment, particularly of the, you know, particularly pertaining to the age group that we were looking at, which is high school age students, right? Um, so, in terms of the nutritional requirements, I'm sure um, most of you have not read PPM 150. It's not really an uh, invigorating piece of literature, um, uh, but it just talks about the specific requirements. So, things like um, salt, uh, fat focuses on a lot of um, um, upper tolerable limits that they, they, they don't want you to exceed. Um, and that can be really difficult uh, when trying to make foods that are appealing to you know, people of that age. Um, and so what they found was originally when the bill was passed, so they took all the, you know, the burgers and fries off the menu, the students then started going elsewhere for, for food, of course, you know, across the street to McDonald's or whatever was nearby. Um, and cafeterias began to shut down. Okay, a very large amount of cafeterias shut down because of that. Um, and so again, as I said, we were approached by uh, the TDSB and QP to develop these recipes and utilizing our students. So some of actually some of the students that I, I taught to um, with, uh, with uh, the nutrition and labeling course, um, we developed these recipes that were again appealing to high school age students but also met the requirements of this bill. And that was some difficult task um, to, uh, to tackle. Uh, a lot of times we would come back and the food would be so tasty uh, and then we'd punch it into what I like to refer to as uh, the magical nutrition facts table creator, which is a software called Genesis. Um, input it into that, and then boom, it's it's too high in sodium. Oftentimes, that was the the issue: is it was always too too high in sodium or too too high in fat, specifically saturated fat. And so we had to come up with creative ways to um, make the food taste good, but also meet these requirements. So in finding food enhancers like things, um, you know, like citrus, zest and juice, um, ginger, garlic, um, spices, herbs, um, vinegars, that sort of stuff in lieu of uh, fat, salt or sugar, right? So we had to be very creative in that sense. And some of the recipes that you think would have taken no time at all took the most time. Um, we had one in particular, so um, french fries, as I said, removed from the, the menu. Um, one recipe in particular with uh, potato potato wedges was the, the recipe we came up with in lieu of the french fries. 
that took forever. <laughs> we must have done, I don't know, a dozen trials of that recipe. Um, and so in terms of, just to kind of give you an idea in terms of the recipe development process, we would, um, the students would think of an idea, come up with a potential recipe, we test it, taste it, and it never, it very rarely works the very first time, um, and then test it again, taste it, and of course all along this time we're also inputting the nutritionals into Genesis, trying to figure out whether or not they meet the requirements. Um, and this recipe in particular was so hard because we couldn't use that much fat. I think it was like two tablespoons for 24 portions of like six potato wedges. Um, is what it ended up being, very small amount of fat, and then also with, with salt too. So again, we had to be creative, so we used things like garlic powder, onion powder to provide flavor without additional salt or sodium, right? Um, and then other things worked a little easier. So the butter chicken actually recipe was pretty quick. We also refer to it as the butterless butter chicken. <laughs> There's no actual butter in it because that, of course, would not meet the requirements. Um, on that note, we also took into consideration diversity of, of, of Toronto, too. So we, we came up with different recipes that we thought would be culturally diverse. So things like butter chicken, the fish tacos, the Greek salad. Um, and then also took some traditional things that were sold in cafeterias and just made them a lot healthier. Um, yeah, and so that was kind of some of the challenges that we faced. Um, the Caesar salad is another good example. So Caesar salad, we know traditionally, really heavy, you know, cream sauce, lots of lots of eggs, um, bacon, of course. Um, and what we did in lieu of all of that was use um, a bean sauce. We used cannellini beans and made a, a dressing out of those, which increases the fiber, which is also a requirement that we need to meet. Um, and then also reduces, obviously, the saturated fat. And then in lieu of things like bacon, we used sun-dried tomatoes to kind of give that color. Um, and it was one, it's one of the most popular ones that, in terms of um, sensory evaluation. Um, and on that note, too, so again, we actually involved the students who would potentially be eating these in the cafeteria in the whole process. We had tastings, and they would evaluate it give us feedback, we take that feedback into consideration, and then again with the retesting and all that stuff. So um, again, it was a very challenging process, but also really rewarding. So now we've actually got the recipes developed, um, and they're kind, of, they're kind of in limbo right now. At some point, they will be hopefully distributed to um, the GTA, so different schools all over the place. Um, but in the meantime, we've actually had um, some training. So with some of the, the, the QP staff or quote unquote lunch ladies uh, this past August. So they, we had a group of, and they were all ladies and they were all a wonderful bunch of human beings. They were so great and so enthusiastic to be there and learn about how they can create healthy, tasty recipes and meet the requirements of PPM 150, but also you know low in fat, salt, sugar, that sort of stuff, uh, but also still taste good, of course. Uh, and so I think there's one circulating uh, around. When we get to it, I'll show you. but. Um, we essentially did a, a, did a three-day, very intense training with these ladies uh, on how to how to do just that. Because a lot of times the, the the staff don't get much culinary training, and so um, yeah, it's 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 just it was it was very it was neat for them. They had a, they had a great experience, and of course they're applying that too. And then they feel like they're part of like being the you know the frontline worker they're 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 contributing to um you know a healthful society that sort of thing but yeah so that was a lot of fun and then oh yeah and then training in schools as well there's also another picture that's um circulating too where we actually went into different high schools and we had some of the high school students um cook with us uh some of the recipes that we developed and then we served them to their family um, and got feedback that way as well. So that was kind of neat too. Um, and hopefully at some point very soon those will be distributed throughout again the, the, the GTA. That's the butter chicken there. Okay, and of course portion sizing is of the utmost importance. Those are the fish tacos. That's um, uh, the vegetarian chili, which was a neat recipe because it originally started as a sloppy joe recipe. And then anything that's left over, so say there was leftovers from the sloppy joe, it was then put into a chili. So again, thinking about food wastage and, and how we can um, eliminate that. Um, this is one of the uh, outreaches that we did with the students. So the two in the center there, high school students. And we're teaching them. I'm not sure which recipe that is. Oh, it's the taco. No, no, that's a sloppy joe. 
Is it the burrito? Is it the Sloppy Joe? It looks like a Sloppy Joe wrap. But anyways, and then there's more outreach stuff as well. And, like, all the students were so appreciative and so happy. And, like, they really just love to get hands-on practical training. Because, I mean, it is like it is like an art form, but then it's also very, obviously, very scientific in terms of what we had to do <laughs> to meet those nutritionals. Yeah. Okay. So, I think, I mean, in terms of um, the overall particularly for this project and the one that, that Candace just spoke about, just kind of um, to bring it all in, to bring it all home, um, it's how important it is uh, to incorporate the two together, so science and, and art. Um, it's a very rewarding job. I know Candace and I are very, we thank our lucky stars every day. We go to work. It's really fun. It's rewarding. But we also feel like we're making a bit of a difference too. Um, so I don't know. I'm I'm very excited to be ha part of the a movement that um, uh, works towards you know a healthy lifestyle, um, but is also about creative hands-on learning and training. Um, yeah. Did you want any any closing notes? No. Okay. Great. Fantastic. So I guess we'll just open it up now to to questions. If anybody has any questions about the project or. Uh, the questions if you have if you have some like this one and then uh, we'll move on to the next one. A panel. Oh, okay, great. Okay, fantastic. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, are you working with other groups or an um, okay. Um, right now, currently, we are just working with the Toronto District School Board, um, but that's not to say that later on there can't be other collaborations with other groups. Yeah. I know at George Brown they really stress local sustainable food. So as much as possible, they try to partner with local farms and that sort of stuff. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we've also, the project that we've worked um, with uh, St. Michael's Hospital was funded by Greenbelt. So um, we've been working with them on a couple of different projects. Um, and it's been really great because we have a lot of Work with that to help them implement these, these uh, in their establishment. Yeah. For for example, the the training I was talking about, we tried to we tried to use the recipes that would would fit the most in season vegetables at the time. So for example, with um, there was a falafel wrap that had a mango chutney, but instead of using mangoes, we used peaches at the time. Yeah, which was it was really tasty too. <laughs> yeah, great. Sure, that's fine. Okay. Sure. And just want to say thank you. Perfect. Just want to Yeah, that's Yeah. 
I think so. Is this on? <laughs> Roberta, can I use this as like yeah. a... You can put it on yeah, top. okay. Hi, everyone. I want to thank you all for coming and to Roberta for organizing this. Uh, my name is Amanda White. Um, well, I guess she already introduced me, so I don't need to describe <laughs> uh, who I am. But um, my research at Queens right now uh, looks at um, human and plant relationships and exchanges um, and specifically through art production. So um, I'm just going to, yeah. Okay, so of course one of the most important ways in which we engage with plant life is through eating, and as uh, Michael Pollan writes in this quote from his book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, the act of eating in fact represents our most profound engagement with the natural world. As the artist or an artist on this panel, I wanted to start my portion of the discussion by exploring what art or cultural production can contribute to the kinds of questions that we are interested in examining tonight, um, to thinking about issues as serious as food security or our personal relationship to agricultural processes, and thinking about the ways in which art can contribute meaningfully to social change in these areas. Um, possibly by imagining alternatives. In my own work, I often hope to look at some of these issues in ways that are open to discussion, playful, and participatory. So I'm going to start by talking about an older project of mine that um, sort of started this body of work um, about food. So um, this is a project called Farmy, um, which tried to sort of be playful and talk about um, gorilla gardening um, while still sort of addressing serious issues around food awareness, access um, in urban spaces. Um, for this project, uh, small parachute troopers were cast from children's toys in a um, compost, clay, and seed mixture using biodegradable shoots. The soldiers were deployed strategically around city spaces um, in an attempt to reimagine an agricultural landscape. So each of these soldiers were embedded with a different type of food seed. Uh, and this is um, an installation of the project uh, at a storefront in Kensington Market in 2010. Um, visitors were encouraged to participate in the project by taking a trooper home with them and then taking it somewhere, uh, dropping it and reporting that drop location, um, and sending in photos if they can. And then we would add their information to our maps. Um, so, uh, let's, yeah, and so these are some images of troops being deployed. <laughs> um, and uh, through doing this, you sort of start to think about the spaces that are around you and what they're being used for or what they're not being used for. And um, so that was um, some of the feedback that I got and also um, some of my own experience with that. And then these are some ex images that were sent in by participants. You can see City Hall on the right, and there's a, that one's actually in a farmer's market, which is kind of funny. Um, and then over the lake, it's very beautiful. So yeah, so these are some um, images that people sent in. Um, and then finally, the project also existed online. Um, using Google Maps, I was able to input all of the locations and the seed types along with photos if we had some um, of the troops in action. So let's pass this. Okay. Um, so this leads me into a really recent project um, called Cultivating Windsor that I did as part of a, um, a residency project where I was working with um, the community gardening and farmers market organizations in Windsor. Um, I was asked to collaborate with them on some public and participatory projects that would similarly look at issues around food. Um, so, um, so I have sort of a, a long explanation for this project, so you'll have to bear with it. But um, I was interested, for this project specifically, I was interested in looking at another relationship between people and food plants and the connection between farming knowledge and agrobiodiversity. Specifically, 
the agrobiodiversity, which that agrobiodiversity, which is the diversity of species cultivated for agricultural needs, is both linked to sustainability in agriculture and is correlated with the number of small farms and farmers. So in her text, the same one that I cited here, Laurie Anthrop describes the way in which dominant modes of agriculture have eroded biodiversity in plant genetic resources and livestock, as well as insect and soil organisms, all of which had originally been developed by agricultural practices in the first place. So Thrupp describes the alarmingly small number of crops that are currently used globally in contrast to the number that have been cultivated historically in the quote above. So although people consume approximately 7,000 species of plants, only 150 species are commercially important, and 103 species account for 90% of the world's food crops. According to these findings, for example, many of the vegetable varieties that we cultivate in the United States that were cultivated in the United States 100 years ago are now extinct. And similarly in Europe, thousands of flax and wheat varieties have disappeared since the introduction of a few high-yielding high varieties. In his paper, A Future for Fault Small Farms, Biodiversity and Sustainable Agriculture, James Boyce refers to small-scale farmers as the keystone species in agricultural ecosystems, arguing that they hold great value by developing and maintaining a diversity of agricultural species, and yet they themselves are an endangered species. So... <laughs> He notes that especially in industrialized countries of the global north, the number of smallholder farms has been diminishing over recent generations. And by examining this correlation between the loss of farming knowledge and the decline in agrobiodiversity, we can see the importance of continuing these practices on a personal scale, from home gardens to community gardens to participation in community-shared agriculture farms. Basically, I want to emphasize the importance of sharing agricultural knowledge across communities and generations in alternative ways as the traditional family farm model disappears. So this is sort of a long-winded explanation for this project, but for this Cultivating Windsor project, we put a call out to find people who are interested in sharing, exchanging, and learning about food cultivation and production. We looked for people who had information to share and communities or individuals who wanted to learn those things and set up a series of workshops around this kind of knowledge exchange. Uh, so this turned into a series of workshops um, that were led by and for different community members. Um, this, in this example, a local CSA farmer, Rochelle Tremblay, um, who had a personal interest in wild edibles, um, was interested in teaching um, about some of that information. And um, we put together a guided tour of a space in downtown Windsor and um, participants also got a illustrated um, field guide to take with them. Um, another workshop um, led by artist, uh, an artist, Lydia Burgraff, um, was an attempt, is a project that she's been working on, um, attempting to recreate her grandmother's apple pie. So Lydia's been developing her pie making skills under her grandmother's guidance for three years. However, uh, the legacy of her grandma's famous apple pie is being threatened by popular taste in apples, which has caused the specific variety that her the recipe calls for to become increasingly less available, which relates to the um, biodiversity and agriculture issue. Um, this is a sorry, I'm just going to skip this one. <laughs> So um, during the same period in the downtown Windsor Farmers Market, we set up a plant adoption agency. And uh, this was similar to a seed exchange. Um, it functioned as a way that people could share plants and the stories about their plants, and as such began to see them as something other than objects for consumption, um, to see them as beings with a history. Well, that was the idea anyways. So um, when these are the intake forms. So when dropping off plants, the owners would fill out these forms with a description of their relationship or history with the plant. And we then created a database of these individuals. Um, these plants ranged from people having extra numbers of seedlings um, to 30-year-old indoor plants. So there was all kinds of plants. Um, and for the adoption process, the plants were then put out uh, for adoption with their histories sort of paraphrased on these cards. And people could stop by the booth at the farmer's market, um, take a plant, and give it a good home. 
during the project, hundreds of plants were given new homes. It was fairly successful. Um, and many children really enjoyed this. Um, I think the option um, was fun for them. Um, but here's an image that was sent in of a plant in its new home and with its new family. So, um, so I def now I'm going to sort of switch and talk about um, another project and about farming on a totally personal scale and exploring the kind of human food plant relationship that happens on a biological um, symbiotic level between our bodies and plant bodies. So plants communicate biologically with one another and across species, and they do this by using chemical signals such as fragrant odors, visual signals such as bright colors, and sugar rewards associated with their fruits. Uh, many of these forms of communication have evolved into symbiotic relationships with other species. Um, and, uh, for example, they can attract animals who will eat, digest, and disperse the seeds of their fruit. Um, a frugivore is an animal who consumes large amounts of fruit in their regular diet. By doing so, frugivores disperse the seeds of said fruit plants in their feces. The larger the animal, the larger the seeds they can swallow and therefore ingest and disperse, which supports the habitat and growth of fruiting trees and plants. These are just some frugivores. <laughs> so... Um, so then this is the, my project um, uh, titled Frugivore Botanical Animal, um, where I attempt to communicate with plants by revisiting this mutual and biological relationship that exists between mammals and their food plants. To do this, I incorporate the natural cycle of a fruit-eating mammal into the human process of fruit crop, crop cultivation. In Frugivore, I'm growing plants from the seeds of cherry tomatoes that I first purchased from the grocery store. Uh, then ate and deposited it in my waste. On October 10th, 2011, this box of gourmet medley tomatoes was ingested, and then seeds traveled through my body, where in my stomach, acids dissolved their seed coat and prepared them for germination. Um, that's the microscopic image of the seeds and what they look like after they've been digested, before and after. So um, instead, of, instead of flushing the seeds down the toilet with my waste, I collected the seeds, I then planted them, fed them with water and urine, helped them to germinate, grew uh, flower, fruit again, and repeated the process within uh, several generations of the plants. So not only did I establish a different relationship with these particular tomatoes, but I'm now responsible for the second generation and for feeding and cross-pollinating these generations, um, choosing which ones are tastier, repeating this process. And so it's the combination of the animal process of being a frugivore and the human process of food crop cultivation that I was mentioning before. Um, so this leads me to talk a little bit about the idea of disgust. Um, obviously, um, that issue comes up when talking about this project, um, but I like to think about <laughs> this project as an experiment and thinking about the human body as a mammalian body and trying to understand why we find our own waste so disgusting and we are okay with using other animals' waste in our food production. Um, so, you know, things like pea cycling and humanure are sort of contested while we will use compo composted cow manure, no problem. Um, and so this quote from a researcher on disgust kind of sums it up. Um, it says that anything that reminds us that we are animals elicits disgust. Disgust functions like a defense mechanism to keep human animalness out of awareness. So Oh, yeah, and sorry, and that was just me testing the pH of the soil after using my own urine to feed the plants, just making sure it worked. Um, and so these are uh, the plants. As they continued to grow, they sort of filled my studio. They became extremely large, and they're clearly industrial-type plants. Um, they look nothing like the kind of cherry tomato plants that you see in your domestic gardens typically. Um, and they eventually took over my studio space completely. I then built a really large indoor 
um, greenhouse for them that was 8 by 16 feet, um, which you can see here. Um, in this installation, there were two generations of plants in this space. Um, there's fans, there's humidifiers, um, there's two hydroponic system, light systems. Um, and this is all from like a tiny container of cherry tomatoes. So here um, is just some examples of the, I think there's 10 um, of the uh, leaves and fruits of the different plants, um, just to give you a sense of what came out. Um, and then alongside the installation, I used this, this sort of more traditional kind of botanical drawing style to illustrate the cyclical system of eating, digesting, growing, eating, again, um, rather than using a text-based sort of thing to describe it. Um, this is a video that I'm not showing. Um, so this is just another uh, installation of the project. This is the third generation that um, was shown in Winnipeg um, in the winter. And uh, in a smaller greenhouse, this is uh, just some plants at the beginning and sort of like midway through um, the growing process. So um, one other thing I wanted to say about this project and in, in the um, installations, uh, the gallery installations of the actual plants, and then in some other iterations of the project where I've just shown the actual fruit. Um, always part of that is um, having uh, some of the fruit there um, as edible for people to eat if they like. Unfortunately, I didn't bring any today, but <laughs> so this isn't an example of that. But um, And people are always invited to eat the tomatoes. And this is always an interesting moment um, to see whether people are comfortable with doing that or not. And a lot of people are, but not everybody is. Um, so I'm just going to, oh yeah, and this is just another from a workshop, same kind of thing. Um, and I just want to leave you with this quote from this great book called Eating Anxiety. Um, because eating constitutes such an intimate engagement with our other beings in the material world, the discourse of eating consolidates and intensifies broader feelings about the relations between the self and other, between public and private, and between human and non-human. So, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Just a quick comment. Sure. I hear you saying give human waste a chance. <laughs> Just give it a chance. <laughs> yeah. um, that reminded me of the first project of Carmen. Yeah. Um, that was a literal application of an idea of where Going back to I don't have a plane. I, I thought about getting like a remote control one. Like, right. Do you think the Canada Council would give me money for a drone? Yeah, no, it's really interesting. Yeah. It's I mean it's interesting to try and turn some I mean yeah, I mean playing with the idea of war is kind of yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, um, I guess, I, I wasn't trying to be political about war with that, but, but, but it's, yeah, it's part of the, 
I guess the subtext of it. I don't know. University, and uh, um, actually, uh, I know she's working for uh, uh, second harvest on projects that are actually coming from her dissertation, um, which she did on uh, dumpster diving, and she's she's working on on way on and how you can. Um, recycle and like avoid food waste. So anyway, she's going to talk about her experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I will no because I can't quite get this to work. Okay. <laughs> I think it's there. Are you fine? For now. Okay. We might have to rest in a minute. So I'm going to come and pick you up. Anyway, Perfect. There's also this one. If things fall apart, we have a backup. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank that introduction and thank you so much uh, to the other panelists. This has been a fascinating evening so far. <laughs> um, as Roberta said, um, my current work with Second Harvest uh, does uh, come fairly closely out of my research history as a doctoral student at York University. Uh, there were some changes along the way, so as a part of sharing that journey, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about how I became obsessed with where food goes when it's not eaten, um, which has been an obsession for a number of years, as you will see. Um, so when we talk about food, um, as consumers, researchers, artists, scientists, and activists, uh, we often forget about the key part of what it means to be eaters in the world. Eating, similar to all consuming, also means wasting. <clears throat> that is the, uh, the, uh, that which is left over or left behind in the ways that we sustain ourselves. Globally, 30 to 40 percent of what is produced to eat is an actual fact thrown away and finds its resting place in compost and landfills. This is a topic that has consumed my life for years, um, and I'd like to share that journey. Um, so I'll go over a history of where I started and where I've wound up. Um, so my journey started uh, 10 years ago in 2004 when I first heard the term freegan. And it's interesting, I was thinking when I was going over this presentation last night that 2004 gets increasingly further away every time I talk about this story. So now I'm at a decade of being pretty obsessed with food waste. Um, so the first time I heard the term vegan or freegan, it was not um, in the common language. It was something that um, anarchists knew, uh, people in certain vegan communities would be familiar with, but it didn't have the same popular cachet that it has now. So for the, those of you who haven't heard the term freegan, is there anybody who hasn't heard it? Okay, couple. So I'm still introducing people to, uh, to this word. Um, so it actually just comes from the merging of the terms free and vegan. Uh, comes out of an anarchist activist background and the idea that um, vegan eating was preferred um, and also that food shouldn't be thrown away. Um, so in order to be a freegan, one will very commonly take up the practice of dumpster diving. So, for those of you who aren't familiar with the practices of dumpster diving, is there anyone who's, that's new to them? Okay, I'm going to tell you anyway, because perhaps some of our, our viewing audience uh, from around the world isn't familiar with it. Uh, so dumpster diving is a process where people go into dumpsters, these lovely receptacles that are often found behind grocery stores, and pull out food that's been thrown away. This sounds super gross. I understand that. I also should make it very clear, this is very different than the work I do at Second Harvest, which we will get to. Um, sounds super gross until you actually go into a dumpster and discover that actually what the gross part is, is how much quality edible food is being tossed into these receptacles instead of being fed to people. Um, so through the process of researching dumpster diving and freeganism, I came across an amazing uh, activist group called Food Not Bombs, um, which actually has some wonderful overlaps with your farming project that I hope we can talk about later. 
Um, so I moved to Toronto to do my dissertation research and discovered this wonderful group uh, under the, the umbrella term Food Not Bombs. So Food Not Bombs is a global network that uses a volunteer consensus-based model for addressing hunger and wasted food while connecting these social issues to broader anti-capitalist, environmentalist, and anti-oppression activist frameworks. Most simply, FMB groups come together, gather, serve, uh, cook, and serve vegetarian or vegan food without restriction. Um, so without restriction means that you go to a park and you share with whoever wants to, wants to join you. So no one has to pr prove that they're hungry, prove that they're in need, but rather the invitation is open to everyone. Over the history of the movement, the connection between capitalist excess, neoliberal policy decisions, and subsequent increases in global food insecurity and poverty is central to the critique FNB is making. It is not enough to consider any of these concerns independently, but rather FNB seeks to assess the broader social circumstances that interplay between food, wa food waste and hunger. <coughs> At this point, FNB is a global movement with a history of do-it-yourself ethic, um, of a do-it-yourself ethic resting in the hands of volunteers. With a 30-year history, FNB uh, history parallels that of Second Harvest, um, Toronto's food rescue charity, where I'm currently employed. But before that, I was serving people directly. So this is an example of some of the meals we made. Um, the muffins are lovely. Those were, uh, create, those were made by a couple of our members and, uh, served on Ryerson campus years ago. Uh, and they were very excited because then Mayor David Miller came by and ate one of their muffins. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so my dissertation study opened up a world of discovering the complicated ways that food is both discarded and rescued by a number of key players. Uh, key to my discovery as a researcher was the way food waste lives on in dumpsters, uh, the dumpsters it's, in, it's discarded into. For the people I worked with during my research years, food that had been discarded was no less valuable, valuable or edible than that which, could be, that which could be purchased in the stores. Rather, their decision to reclaim food from the dumpster was a part of a broader political statement against the practices of dis discarding quality food in a world where so many people are going hungry. Instead of accepting this practice, food is reclaimed, reworked, uh, and shared with whomever wishes to partake. Central to the work of reclaiming this food to serve without barrier in local parks was also an attempt to move against the charity model of food access. Rather than using institutional structures to share food through bureaucracy, food was claimed and shared by people outside of these structures. Rooted in anarchist politics, um, working against a uh, charity model is a small step towards deinstitutionalizing community sharing and food support. However, the limitations to this approach are an inability to impact larger scale uh, change on either the food system or systemic food insecurity. So my work with Food Not Bombs and my research into food waste directly led to my work now with Second Harvest. Um, so now I find myself on the other side of the charity model. Um, so I joined, my, uh, I joined Second Harvest in spring 2013, <coughs> and where my dissertation research looked explicitly at individual solutions to food waste, um, with a subsequent much smaller impact. Um, Second Harvest has ramped up the work I can do to impact food waste and food insecurity uh, because the scale of the charity model and the organization means that last year we did over 7 million pounds of food, which equals over 19,000 meals every day. <coughs> It's not quite the direct relationship we got to have when we were serving in the park, um, but it is bringing food across the city through over 200 social service agencies. So the model of Second Harvest parallels that of Food Not Bombs. Pick up sur surplus food, bring it to people who need it. Uh, it just does it in, a, simple, in a, a different way. So instead of waiting for food to be discarded, Second Harvest makes, food, makes sure that food doesn't get discarded in the first place. And then uses... Uh, um, fairly wonderful, uh, like wonderful distribution network uh, to use refrigerated trucks to bring um, fresh surplus food directly to social service agencies that can feed it very, very quickly to people who need it. The history of Second Harvest is also also parallels that of uh, Food Not Bombs. So also 30 years ago, where next year is our 30th anniversary, 
there are two women in Toronto who were very, very troubled by the amount of hunger that was happening on the streets of Toronto. And it also noticed that there was a lot of food being thrown away. Uh, so they decided they were going to do something about it. So there were two women with a hatchback, no money, but a whole lot of passion. So they started out with seven agencies and seven food donors, and they would use their hatchback to go door to door to door to pick up food and redeliver it. It was such a good, ex- a good model, and it picked up so quickly that 30 years later, we have seven large-scale refrigerated trucks on the road, uh, as well as a refrigerated van, um, and have a network that goes all across the GTA, um, so both picking up food and serving it. Um, so one of the reasons why um, my, my work, my research work, and my, my work at Second Harvest connects is not only with the topic of food waste and bringing food to people who need it, um, but also looking at why so much food is being wasted. One of the key reasons is the complications in our policy and regulation systems around best before dates. So some of you are probably familiar with, well, I'm sure everyone's seen a best before date, and some of you may have read some of the articles that have come out over the last year, year and a half, questioning how we can understand what these dates mean. So the problem with the fact that the slide I thought was going to be there is not. (laughs) Um, Problem with best before dates. Confusion with what they actually mean. So lots of people, and this happens actually in my business, even though we know better, um, happens with all sorts of manufacturers, the reference to expiry dates. So we actually don't have expiry dates on very many products. In, in Canada. What expires is baby food and nutritional supplements. Everything else is a best before date. So what the difference is and why is this, is this is significant is when you're talking about a best before date or a use by date or a sell by date, these are suggestions. There is nothing about that date, although I'm sure that milk is no longer drinkable <laughs> eight months later. However, When I put this picture up, it was actually very shortly after February 29th. So let's go back to March 2nd. If we were looking at this milk on March 2nd, it's incredibly likely that that milk was still fine. We have this experience every day in our own fridges that we let the dates get close. Some people are, as soon as they see the date come close, they throw the food away. Lots of us play a little fast and loose with that number give it a little sniff, see what's going on, and discover that all these dates are telling us is the prime freshness of a product. So it's wonderful to know that on February 29th, that was going to be the best that milk was going to taste. However, it's also a really good way to move stock. So one of the reasons that Second Harvest is able to use best before dates is our manufacturers know if they have, and milk may not be the best example, but for example, packages of hummus. So you have pallets and pallets and pallets of pre-made hummus that have dates that are about a week out. So you might be able to get that out to your stores. You could get it out on the shelves, but it's probably not going to sell before that date. So the option becomes, okay, we can throw it out. This is something that um, people in the food industry are accustomed to happening. Or we can call a place like Second Harvest. They will pick it up. They will be able to redistribute that within 24 to 48 hours and make sure that people who need it are taking advantage. <clears throat> Sorry, I just talked through like two pages of my, uh, my speech, so I just have to catch up with myself. Okay, so that's one of the ways that Second Harvest is able to do the work we do. Um, it's also interesting to think about um, where we're wasting food. So I'm sure that some of you are very familiar with the, uh, the pressure that is put on, put on individuals, that half of the food waste in this country is coming from consumers, it's coming from individuals, it's coming from you and me. The problem with that is, is that yes, there is 50% that we are responsible for and we should be accountable for managing our own, our own um, purchasing uh, and our fridges so that we're not throwing away food. But there's also another percent that is at every stage of the food system. So everything that goes between getting food from farm to food to us, there are all these sections of food going to waste. And so these are the moments, these are the people I talk to every day um, so that I can make, as we can, number of food being wasted. But it's also significant too, because I don't want to, I don't want to attack the food industry. 
at this moment, um, because they work, we are working with them to create solutions. Um, and they're very, very happy that we can be a part of it. And I'm so, I'm so proud to have our food industry partners. However, what this is also saying is there is a serious problem with our food system. I'm sure many of you already know that. The things we've been talking so far this, uh, tonight have really led to a questioning of what's going on in our food system. But we've built a system which means that this is expected, this is accepted, uh, and a part of how we've developed the production and distribution of food. And that's something we really need to keep uh, conscious of, is we've made food so valueless that $27 billion of food in Canada alone is going to waste every year. Okay, so at this point, I know I have to find out where I am in my PowerPoint. Okay, so a little bit more about second harvest. So what are we doing? So I said, I told you over 7 million pounds. I told you about um, the 19,000 meals a day. Um, but what's interesting is how we've modeled ourselves on a distribution system that works with the food industry. Uh, so 72% of the food we rescue is perishable. And this is something that apart from your traditional food bank. We really focus on fresh food. The reason we focus on fresh food is because it's the kind of food that is severely lacking in uh, hunger relief. It's also far nutrition, it's much more nutritionally sound. I can see our nutritionist nodding. Um, and this is the kind of food that's really hard to get in the hunger relief system. So we focus on that and we built our distribution sen- uh, system around doing that. So we have refrigerated trucks so we can take, a, we can take fresh uh, and frozen product and make sure that we're maintaining it in a safe way until it gets to people who need it. Okay. Yes, we're... <laughs> and now I'm going to wrap up. I'm not quite done. Um, I, what I did want to wrap up with is, um, so it doesn't sound too much like I'm just here shilling Second Harvest, which I'm so proud to be a part of. But to also go back to to my research, what I do now at Second Harvest and the things I've learned about food waste, um, food rescue, and some of the ways forward. Um, So through all of this, one of the things that I've learned is we really have to start thinking beyond the idea of food waste. Um, Because saying food waste is accepting that things just get thrown away. They're discarded, it happens. And our lives are like this. We are, we are consumers that we, we flush away our excess, unless we're an artist who is using it to grow things. Um, but we, we get rid of everything that we're discarding. We don't face our garbage, we don't face our pollution, we don't face our personal waste, we get rid of it. We're doing the same thing with our food. We have a significant flaw in our food system that is throwing away, again, 30 to 40% of the food that is grown and produced is just getting tossed. And so calling it food waste is accepting that that's okay. So I'm inviting you to think not only about the food that might be wasted because of in your own homes because you forgot about that tomato, you forgot about the leftovers, you got really busy and didn't have time to cook, which happens to us all, happens to me too, Um, but also start questioning in a larger way, what does it mean about our food system? Not only that we grow things unsustainably, that we ship uh, garlic from China, (laughs) <laughs> but we so easily have accepted that so much of the food we're producing, all of that energy, all of those resources, it's fine to throw it away. So thank you. Is it, is it illegal for you to uh, distribute food that's past the expiry date? Um, well, as I said, that we don't have, ex- oh, sorry. The question was, is it illegal? Yeah. So it was asking about the legality. Um, that was part of the script that I just went off book and didn't talk about, so I'm glad you asked that question. So it isn't illegal. Um, because best before dates are a guideline, um, it's, it's fine as long as it's edible and it's quality. We have very, very strict internal guidelines on when we will accept um, accept food to make sure, A, that our agencies will be comfortable with it, and B, also make sure that we're not distributing garbage because that's not what we do. Uh, in terms of liability, Ontario has had been protected, Ontario food donors have been protected by the Ontario Food Act, Food Donation Act, since 1995. So this, uh, this act says that any food donor who donates food um, in good faith, as in they did not deliberately um, adulterate it, uh, they're protected from liability. I can also say that that's the, that's the law, that's the regulation. 
in actuality, no one has ever gotten sick from our food. We have never had an issue. Um, this has never been a problem that we've come across. There was another question in the back. Yeah, I'm not clear. There is a second phone number because. Is there a phone number? <laughs> Um, we often get, we often do uh, get phone calls from individuals. Uh, we, because we have to make sure that we're using our resources in the most efficient way possible, um, we can only pick up up to um, uh, 100 pounds. Uh, so you have to have 100 pounds to donate, and we can pick that up. And a minimum of 100 pounds, yes. And with your freezer, too, it would depend. If they were packaged goods, we would love to accept them. If they were leftovers that you had made, uh, we wouldn't be able to accept that because we need to make sure that we're uh, respecting uh, Toronto um, health uh, codes for uh, safe uh, food handling. Okay. No, no, no definitely no roadkill. <laughs> Um, um, last question, and then we'll move to discussions. Yes, I'm assuming you've seen the documentary Just Eat It. Yes, I have. So the question is uh, about the documentary Just Eat It. Yeah. That was an interesting uh, outlook. Mm -hmm. um, so Just Eat It uh, is actually the first uh, Canadian documentary um, about uh, food waste, which is wonderful because it's nice to see um, work being done in Canada. Uh, we actually, Second Harvest was interviewed for, for that documentary, but we didn't make the final cut because, <laughs> I know, we shoulda, but I, we, I was not the decision maker. Uh, what wound up happening is they'd also talked to an organization in Vancouver, uh, and because the filmmakers were from, from Vancouver and had been volunteering with that organization, uh, they talked to them instead. But it's actually, it's a wonderful documentary. It has a lot of really interesting information about the Canadian context. Also talks to American experts and puts it in kind of a North American context. And I happen to know that there's going to be another screening of it, uh, I think November 24th, um, somewhere on U of T campus. It's about food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the question was, in a minute or less, what is about? I don't want to take away from the filmmakers. I'm sure they actually have a wonderful trailer. Um, but in a broader sense, it is tracking uh, some of the reasons why so much food is going to waste um, in the industry. Uh, so they do a lot of food rescuing of their own for their, for their own needs. Um, and then talk to people who work in the retail sector, talk to farmers, uh, talk to people at the Canadian um, uh, food, food agency. So painting a broader picture of why food is going to waste. Um, that is a really good question that I don't have an answer to because I do not remember. Thank you. Discussion. I would like everybody to be here, like all the presenters, and then maybe we can use this microphone and uh, we, we can repeat the questions. Switch off. Yeah, and we switch off between this microphone and then we can also pass to that one. So, just to move it. I hope somebody listens. <laughs> Of yours or, or, or old school things? 
So the question was, um, we haven't talked about organic, uh, non-organic, GMO, non-GMO, uh, and how this interacts with the work we're doing in other areas. So at George Brown, I mean, we 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 do incorporate organic produce in our in our recipes and that sort of thing. Um, it really depends on the the industry partner what their interests are. Um, for for first in particular, um, on a personal note, when I'm talking about organic versus GMO to my students, we uh, provide both sides of the story um, because obviously GMO. Um, we don't necessarily know the long-term effects of that, but um, also things like golden rice, for example, which is a combination of rice and vitamin A together is such a wonderful thing to be able to provide to developing countries who are going blind, right? That sort of thing. So I, we provide both sides of the, the argument. Um, but in terms of the specific stuff we do at the Food Innovation Research Studio, it really just comes down to what the industry partner is uh, is interested in pursuing. So organic sometimes comes up, not always. I think uh, local and sustainable is um, a bigger um, issue and, and something that we're kind of directing our industry partners uh, to and it's part of the mandate for the college as well. I think um, indirectly in my frugivore project I sort of have um, that plays a role um, because the tomatoes that I used are GMO and you're actually not legally allowed to use those seeds um, because they're trademarked. Um, they're, what's that called again? Yeah. yeah. So I guess this, yeah, there's that sort of like underlying kind of, you know, should it be illegal to you know, eat food and then shit it out and then um, grow things from that. I mean, it's sort of like a natural process that you can't. Um, so, yeah, I guess in a, in a small way, that's part of that project a little bit. But. Uh, well, at Second Harvest, we, um, we would love to be able to feed uh, people as healthy food as we could, uh, but we're also working with the food industry it is, as it is, uh, so we accept um, produce if it's organic or not organic, um, just as long as it's really high quality. Um, but my research self has an interesting anecdote uh, that I heard while I was doing my research uh, from someone who lived in Van Vancouver for a short time and worked on Granville Island. Uh, and he was taking out um, the garbage from, from his grocery store. And, of course, part of the garbage was um, beautiful, wonderful, amazing um, uh, fruits and vegetables uh, that were going because there was too much stock and they were a little bit older. Uh, and he went out to uh, the dumpster out back, and there was a dumpster diver in the back looking for his... Uh, for his nightly finds. Uh, and so this person reported the story to me that he said to this person, um, oh, well, I have this box. Um, do you want it? And so the diver looked over at him uh, and said, oh, no, no, thank you, but I only eat organic. Starving artists can use a lot of, bit of uh, uh, 
food from second harvest too. <laughs> this was a joke, but. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Fine. More serious. Uh, I think in New York, um, we made the kind of very unconventional proposition that the farm table model, which has been kind of mainstreamed, is not radical enough. Because if you look at still within that model, what's going on people's plate, there's still the meat portion, and there's the you know fancier vegetable whatever, and so. I don't know what it was, uh, but you could probably Google it and find out. So he's elevated, there's a hierarchy of kind of value and meaning of the portions of a plate where it's still meat centric, I guess, if that's the word. Um, but what he was getting at is uh, taking the things that are usually secondary or tertiary, like your uh, little Julian piece of carrot, and making that primary. Like, sort of, uh, Reclassify, redefining uh, the components of what is actually on the plate. So this would be far away from taking what's popular and modding it, which I like, and mod tacos so they're be more nutritious. So does that, make, does that question make any sense? Within the farm table model, it's still kind of conventional on the plate itself. So, so the question is, um, is uh, based on a critic out of New York who has questioned the farm-to-table model as not being radical enough and rather reinforcing uh, the way um, we have already uh, been eating. Uh, I'm just going to make a quick uh, comment because I know that our nutritionist has tons to say about this. Um, but as a, as a food researcher, one of the things that I, I frequently came across was uh, research about um, the political history of uh, things like food guides uh, and how we find uh, the kind of food popularized as healthy food and the way we, we think we're supposed to eat to be healthy. Um, so there's a long political history about who has who has lobbying power, who has money, um, why there are certain food types that wind up on our food guides, um, not necessarily because they're the healthiest for us, but I will pass it over to you. Okay, so I would tend to agree with you and you as well. Um, Canada's food guide. What I usually say to my students starting off is it's Canada's food guide. It's not Canada's food Bible. It's not necessarily something you need to follow to a T. It might be an okay starting point, but I do agree that there's a lot of influence as to what is on it because of, of lobbying. Um, yeah, so um, I would definitely agree with that. And in terms of rejigging what a plate, what a balanced plate looks like, I 100% agree with you that it's mostly meat centric, and that is a proper term. Um, yeah, so focusing more on 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 plant based. Um, food is definitely something that we need to, I think, as a society, need to focus more on. Um, and actually, with the project we 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 did at uh, HL for HL Squared, um, we focused a lot on vegetarian options or having vegetarian options because I I feel like we're moving kind of in that direction a little bit, not nearly as fast enough as I think we necessarily should be. But um, we did fo we we had about 50% of the recipes were were vegetarian. Um, um, but also focusing on other, like protein, obviously, but plant-based protein as opposed to, to meat in particular. Um, but yes, I would definitely agree with you that we need to shift um, the focus from um, from the things that we're, we, we're not, like, and this is coming from me, I grew up on a beef farm. <laughs> my, my dad is a farmer, and that's, it was always, you know, what are you having for dinner? You're having meat with some sort of vegetable and some sort of potato. It was, it was always, you know, you're having chicken for dinner, you're having beef for dinner, it was... Um, that was what you focused on. Yeah, but I agree 100%, not just for um, the environment, but also for our health later on in life. I think we really need to focus more on plants, for sure. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Actually, stand and stand and next to this near the screen. Because the audience was doing Oh, shoot. Okay. No worries. We'll stand over here. <laughs> uh, no, I think you can see everything, but they could just be uh, us discussing it. Okay, okay, great. And, and they don't need to see me, I'm going to do this.
Um, it's interesting, too, in terms of regulations, because uh, currently I don't know how many people uh, have uh, been followers of Field Roast or the battles they're having with the food and, Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Uh, but Field Roast is an amazing uh, vegan um, line of sausages and roasts. Um, everything's plant-based, um, and it's wonderful. Uh, and they're actually not able to ship their products into Canada anymore because they refuse to put meat substitute on their packaging. Uh, because they don't see themselves as meat substitute, but rather as their own as their own product. Um, so it's turn it's a it's a really important political battle in terms of how we think about meat, how we think about where we get our uh, protein. And I think you might have more to add. <laughs> I actually didn't know that, um, but I do know in terms of the the CFI or the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And for those of you who don't know who they are, they're essentially our food police. So f their first job is to make sure we don't die from our food supply. And the second one is to make sure that the labeling that is on packaging is correct. Um, and that's a big one, particularly with meat substitutes in, in, in Canada. If you are acting as a meat substitute, and I just did quotation marks for those at home, um, it needs to have the same uh, nutritional um, it needs to be as nutritionally sound as, say, an actual meat product. So it, you know, has to have the same similar amounts of, um, you know, vitamin, you know, B12 and um, and iron and all that sort of stuff. And so, in order to be, you know, pretend to be a substitute, it needs to be the, meet the same sort of nutritional requirements. So that's really interesting. And yeah, I think I think really it it yeah, we definitely need to redefine what we consider to be a good source. Of, of protein because it doesn't have to necessarily come from an animal. Does anybody feel like the audience can like the best of us? This way, now this way. <laughs> well, I don't know if you have uh, people who uh, are monitoring us or is it people from home? Who doesn't have the people from home that are actually tuning in? Uh, I don't have the name uh, here, but yeah, <laughs> people are asking. Just in case, in case people are coming in and are wondering why people are moving around, it's because we are told, we are told so. <laughs> um, so, I actually have a comment uh, which is related to, um, to this uh, um, <coughs> that we just discussed. And it's, uh, like, it sounds to me that there's like, you know, in your presentation, there's a huge battle going on between taste and food regulation and taste and by taste I mean like not just the taste that the physical taste that, that people um, enjoy but also like the habit their habits like the fact that uh, like we are used to, do, to doing so and so we are not going to be willing to change we are used to having um, um, tomatoes that are this size and uh, we don't want to to have to make the bruise that we don't want to eat in a certain way. We don't want to change our habits. Um, we need to have uh, the steak on our plate and uh, the vegetables on the side and not vice versa. So uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, like there's, but there's a big battle because then if you change your habits, then you have to clash against regulations and uh, policies. Um, so um, how do you see this problem? Because I see this problem coming out in all the a little bit. I mean, I guess in, is this, yeah. Um, I guess in what I'm doing, I'm not concerned with regulations, but there is the idea of um, trying to take what's sort of um, the status quo and question that and um, look for alternatives um, or sort of like imagine alternatives in a way. Um, so yeah, that's the, I mean, that's the struggle, but that's like the, I guess the point of um, most of the work that I was talking about, I think, is that we have to try and reimagine some of these systems because the current ones don't really function. So even though the things that I'm proposing aren't actual strategies that people would use, like no one's going to start their own poo garden or, um, you know, uh, start treating plants like people. But I think that when you sort of 
start to imagine those things and you start to think about what's wrong with the way that they're currently being done. So I know that's not um, exactly sort of, but that's sort of in my, from my perspective with my work, that's kind of what I'm thinking with that. Did you? Um, so it's interesting when you ask that, um, and I, um, <clears throat> uh, going back to my to my research days, uh, is uh, the changes that happened along with agricultural um, or industrial agriculture rising is um, a factorization of of our food. So not only in the way it was produced, but in the way we as consumers were trained to expect it to look. Uh, so. Um, for those of us who have gone to both farmers markets and grocery stores, which I'm sure most of us have, uh, the difference between the kind of products that are available and the way fruits and vegetables look um, in their natural diversity versus the culling that happens at our um, in our in our retailers. Uh, so this has been a long process of increasingly selecting foods to be better looking or more easily transportable um, rather than nutritious um, or grown close to home or um, organic or other um, ways of producing food that we might value more um, as, as eaters. Uh, so, and this is becoming uh, kind of a heated battle between increasing um, selection based on ease of transport or appeal to consumers uh, versus things like the inglorious fruits and vegetables movement in France where um, a grocery chain whose name uh, escapes me at the moment uh, has purposely been marketing ugly fruits and vegetables, so things that would normally not be selected to be in a retail store, um, and selling them at a discounted rate. It's it been incredibly popular. Uh, they're flying off the shelves. People love it. And on the other hand, we're in a year where um, square watermelons hit the market. So um, square watermelons, um, bloody expensive for a watermelon, um, but also really ideal for shipping because square watermelons sure pack a whole lot easier than our traditional um, big round watermelons. So I guess going back to the whole regulation um, question, um, obviously we had specific guidelines, again, if we're talking about the specific project that I mentioned this evening, um, we had specific requirements that we needed to meet for uh, – for well, it's in order in order to make it nutritionally the recipes nutritionally sound, um, and that was very difficult. And it did. I feel like in a way it actually enhanced our creativity. For example, the um, the cannellini bean dressing that we that we did for the the Caesar salad. Um, I feel like personally. If I'm given restrictions and borders, I find that you have to you have to be more creative in order to meet those specific regulations. So I kind of encourage in terms of my own work, I like I like having a little bit of restriction and then yeah, and then finding creative ways how to, to how to, like how to meet that. Yeah. So Amy spoke about restrictions just in, in recipe development, and uh, we find um, all kinds of different regulations, just um, stipulations, just for recipe development. But one of the products um, that Roberta was looking at right now, that's um, a different different kind of uh, regulations, all coming from CFIA uh, in terms of the packaging, the size of the, the, the panel at the back, um, the material that you're you're putting your product in um, I invite you guys to just come up and, and take um, take one um, and try it but for our on for the first um, office the CFIA is is, is king like yeah. <laughs> we can't get away um, get around that especially for for products Yeah, so this was a, a project that we work with an, another nutritionist. Um, she had this recipe that she was making for her patients, and they all loved it, and she started selling it to them and wanted to send it to a um, 
uh, a store and sell it commercially. So there are four um, flavors, which we helped her develop um, different flavor profiles. Uh, we helped her source the packaging, do the nutritional requirement, and do um, nutrition panel. Um, and our stipulation for that was it was supposed to be 100 calories um, and no processed uh, ingredients, everything to be natural. So she's selling around the, the city right now. So you can, you'll see it everywhere. Soon, and uh, we d we included um, the school of design to come up with some of the packaging, the the design work. Yeah, circulate them. Why not? Any other questions or comments? What's the most awesome thing you've seen in the last two weeks in this field? The most awesome thing that you've seen in this field in the last two weeks? I think the presentation that, uh, <laughs> that she did today. <laughs> I would agree with that. <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> but this is a good uh, uh, time to finish this session. session. Um, thank you so much for accepting to come here. Very, very enlightening and like super exciting. And the presenters were great and entertaining. <laughs> and I am sure the people at home were very entertained as much as the people here. Thank you so much for coming. Roughly every month or so, uh, we are planning four laser uh, um, events uh, uh, two this, this fall and two in the winter, and we are also planning uh, the monthly basis uh, the uh, art science alone. And uh, um, if you want to sign up for the latest uh, uh, events of you can sign up. Please here for those who want to sign up. It's very like low uh, uh, topic. The no, no, it's fine. It's just to invite you to the next one. Or you can go in, uh, to our um, website, which is uh, www.accessmon.com. No, uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, I have cards if, if you want them. Thank you. Thank you.